Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today. It's my pleasure to introduce Reiner Volkmer. Uh, Reiner earned his diploma and a PhD in physics from the University of Heidelberg. Um, he stayed on for another year there as a postdoc, which included a research stay at Euphore? Euphor. 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 Yeah. Um, in Spain, and as well at the University of Leeds and the University of Bremen. Uh, he then moved to the U.S. on two consecutive postdoc fellowships where he worked uh, with Mario Molina at MIT and then in San Diego. So since 2007, Reiner has been an associate professor at CU Boulder at the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry. Um, and in 2008, he became a fellow of series and was awarded an NSF career grant. Um, over the last few years... <laughs> over the last few years, Reiner has led um, a series of field studies studying the exchange between the tropical ocean and the troposphere, and he's going to present some of those results from that work today in his talk titled Multiphase Chemistry of Marine Trace Gases. So, welcome. Thanks. Thanks, Becky. And it's good to be back. I was here in 2004, I think, the last time, so I guess every 10 years is a good rhythm to, uh, to give an NCAR seminar. At that time, I was, um, uh, we were just coming back from Mexico City, and we had some exciting results on glyoxal, which I showed. And so uh, this, for those who were in the audience, I see some of you uh, that were there 10 years or nine years ago, is an update on the same molecule. Uh, <laughs> but things have moved quite a bit. And uh, if you can study one molecule for 10 years, uh, that molecule has a unique story to tell. And, and that is, in a way, um, what, what I want to uh, convey to you. I do want to point out that this is a large uh, collaborative effort um, where many of you have contributed. Um, I, uh, I'm talking mostly about Torero results today with some uh, update on recent chamber experiments that we have done in terms of how glyoxal actually associates with aerosols through multiphase chemistry. And, um, and there's a couple of papers that uh, we have published here on this uh, SOA work recently, including co-authors here in the audience. I was to try to attribute credit as we go through the slides here, basically. So what's shown here is um, uh, uh, the ocean color-coded by chlorophyll A, and in, in, um, and in red are the flight tracks of the NSF NCAR G5 during the Torero project. And I want to start out by uh, talking a bit about uh, the background. Don't need to talk much about tropospheric ozone and its relevance as a, as a radical precursor to remove greenhouse gases uh, from the atmosphere or its role as a greenhouse gas to this audience. Um, but I do want to kind of give it a spin uh, in the context of this recent IPCC assessment and in light of Torero results, just to frame it. Um, then I'm going to show you uh, some instruments we have developed over the past um, six years at CU Boulder. Uh, and uh, these are m instruments that measure trace gases. Um, some of them fly on aircraft and somewhere on the ship. So the black is here kind of the ship track of a NOAA ship, the research vessel Kaimi Moana, which was co-located uh, during six overpasses of the G5 um, We had a second ship here that was actually from Japan. Uh, with Mitsu Uematsu as a PI. So we had two ships and, and one aircraft here during the Torero campaign. So I'm going to show you uh, the instruments that were on the ship and uh, those that were on the plane, and then talk mostly here about Torero results, which was focused on marine trace gases and the exchange from uh, uh, the ocean uh, to the atmosphere, the lower atmosphere initially, but then Torero looked at the distributions through the full tropospheric air column, let's say below 15 kilometers. We actually got to 15 kilometers with a G5 in the tropics um, for five minutes or so at the end of the flight. And uh, then in the second half, talk a little bit about uh, these more recent results that we obtained this summer um, at the uh, Paul Scherer Institute in a um, campaign uh, targeted at, a, at a, what I think is actually a fundamental concept that's relevant for multiphase chemistry and, uh, and worth sharing in this audience. So it's the first characterization of a salting constant and uh, the role of anthropogenic triggers to accelerate multiphase chemistry. So the color code of chlorophyll A here uh, kind of gives away uh, one criteria that I used when I, when I designed these flight tracks. 
Uh, in that, we wanted to contrast what is basically these dark blue colors, which are uh, southern hemisphere oligotrophic ocean, so a least productive ocean environment, with what is coastal upwelling. Coastal upwelling means there's nutrient-rich waters reaching the surface, and these hotspots are biological hotspots uh, in the form of Chilean, a Peruvian upwelling here, and Chilean upwelling down here. So contrasting these coastal environments with mesotrophic large-scale upwelling and non-productive ocean was... Uh, one aspect in terms of these contrasting ocean environments, how do they actually, and do, are they reflected, and how are they reflected in terms of the atmospheric uh, uh, signatures uh, of trace gases that we can see over these different ocean environments. And um, I don't need to go into greater detail uh, with this slide, but I do want to point out that uh, when we think about emissions to the atmosphere, we mostly think about them in the, in the, in the, in the terrestrial context. Uh, where most measurements are, and obviously most pollution sources are located. And so Torero really focuses on what is kind of this cut-off picture here uh, on the right, where we know really little. Um, and in fact, the marine environment has its special challenges, because uh, even a process that is uh, leading to minuscule concentrations uh, can have a significant impact when it comes to source budgets, because 70% of the surface of Earth is, is the ocean. And so when we scale emissions over the ocean, typically what, what models do, including, I think, uh, the um, uh, CAMCAM model here that's uh, run on, uh, on halogens, hey Doug, <laughs> uh, it, it, it scales these emissions by the one indicator you have over the ocean to spatially distributed, which is chlorophyll A, which is basically what's shown here. And 70% of the Earth actually looks like this, this very dark blue, which means there you hardly scale anything. And uh, the, the emission fields kind of get weighted by uh, these, these higher chlorophyll A concentrations. To some degree, uh, the question is, is this type of a signature reflected in what we see in the source fluxes uh, in the atmosphere? So most of our information that we have on emissions is about uh, all those sources that I'm not going to talk about. And there's, there's a data-starved situation when it comes to actually characterizing the ocean environment. Now, these gases, halogens, and uh, organic carbon from the ocean, it, it modifies what we call oxidative capacity, which is uh, the OH radical abundance. It removes methane from the atmosphere. And, um, and also, um, halogens, for example, they destroy ozone. Um, these oxygenated gases is what I'm going to focus on in particular. And um, these oxygenated gases, they associate with particles uh, in part due to vapor pressure uh, in terms of a condensation process here to lead to the growth and formation of secondary organic aerosol material. But uh, there's actually different pathways in how they can contribute to SOAR uh, through cloud processing uh, or through what we call multiphase chemistry in aerosol water, which does not require a cloud. And that's important because even though the water on aerosol particles is minuscule small, uh, about, uh, I mean, the, the, the time that a particle spends in outside a cloud is much longer than actually um, uh, the residence time in a cloud. And so a process that goes on in aerosol water and how does a dilute aqueous phase of clouds compare with a concentrated uh, aerosol aqueous phase uh, in terms of the rates of multiphase reactions uh, is, is something that, uh, that I want to talk about. Now, organic carbon is removed by dry and wet deposition, and it's relevant uh, for all these reasons. Uh, I'm going to focus primarily on the remote marine environment, where uh, the, um, the removal of greenhouse gases uh, is uh, one important aspect of the tropics, uh, but also the formation of cloud condensation nuclei over the, uh, in the marine environment is a, is a major uh, question. Currently, we think, uh, or until a couple of years ago, we thought of it as CLAW which was a sulfur-driven kind of process for particle growth. In the meantime, we have evolved from that. We know there's much more going on than sulfur, uh, and organics are at the core of this. Um, and uh, the other aspect is uh, the interaction of, uh, of light with radiation. The tropics are very um, uh, year-round high, uh, high irradiation. And so uh, clearly, the tropics are uh, part of uh, the climate system where, uh, where the action is. So you all know this slide, and those who don't know it, I don't want you to take away all the details of it, but uh, just point out that it uh, illustrates what is radiative forcing. And if an arrow goes to the right, it means warming. And if an arrow goes to the left, it means cooling. 
And uh, it is the IPCC 2013 assessment that came out, uh, I believe, early this month. And uh, it is grouped here by emitted compounds. Now note that, for example, a gas like ozone is actually not listed here explicitly because it's not emitted. It forms in the atmosphere and it's a balance of transport processes and chemistry. But ozone is a key uh, greenhouse gas um, and it's also relevant in the, in the urban context as, uh, as a, um, a pollution ozone. It's relevant to atmospheric dynamics, to oxidation capacity, and really it affects any of these processes. Ozone is kind of everywhere and woven into these, uh, uh, these, uh, this grouping here, which is grouped by emitted compounds. So it relates, for example, to the removal of methane, and 75% of the methane removal is in the tropics. Um, so background ozone in the tropical free troposphere is key to understanding methane abundances. Organic carbon, for example, which is organic aerosol, uh, is for comparison here a slight cooling potential, and the multiphase chemistry relates to, uh, that I'm going to talk about relates to a source for organic carbon here. And I want to point out that uh, while error bars here um, are still dominated by error bars about the aerosol indirect effect, what I'm going to talk about mostly is actually something that's not even captured in these error bars, because I'm talking about unknown unknowns. And these error bars, uh, they talk primarily, uh, you can only represent an uncertainty if you actually know a process is, uh, is operational. And so these marine sources for organic carbon, for example, are in a category of an unknown unknown. So they wouldn't be reflected in, in any of this, but they do relate, as I believe, uh, uh, to this error bar on the cloud indirect effect actually currently to be underestimated. So this is uh, a, a, a a bell curve that shows you from the South Pole to the North Pole the rate at which methane is removed. And it's just to illustrate that uh, the Torero uh, campaign was really designed to have good overlap with this bell curve. The action is in the tropics, as I said. And I'm going to show you uh, examples from these flight tracks here uh, that in uh, Southern Hemisphere summer overlap basically with this dashed blue line. So any process that I'm going to talk about here is directly uh, relevant to the removal rate uh, of methane uh, if it affects uh, OH radical abundances. OH radicals are the primary uh, oxidant that removes uh, methane in the, in the tropics. And just a reminder that really most of Earth looks like this, um, and we saw a lot of that uh, during uh, Torero. So I'm going to talk about two hypotheses. I want to talk about um, uh, this striking and surprising observation of why a gas like glyoxal is found over the ocean. And what does it mean? Glyoxal over the oceans, if I phrase it in a hypothesis, is, is a smoking gun for other oxygenated VOCs that are currently indicating missing sources for marine organic carbon to the atmosphere. And I uh, put it as a hypothesis that these missing sources have a biological signature. What are we going to do? Uh, we are going to investigate where does it come from and uh, these OVOCs and uh, what comes with it, uh, this glyoxal, and we do that by uh, uh, basically probing four-dimensional um, distributions um, uh, of glyoxal uh, and, and try to uh, learn something about the source mechanism. And with four dimensions, I mean three dimensions in space and, and one dimension in time. So time-resolved measurements in the boundary layer were conducted on the ship, and three dimensions were probed uh, on the aircraft. And then in addition, um, Eric Apel and, and, and Becky here redeployed the TOGA instrument for the very first time, was on its maiden flights during Torero, and uh, measured additional OVOCs. Now, the second hypothesis also relates to glyoxal, and um, I want to say glyoxal multiphase chemistry in aqueous aerosols is due to salting in. So what's salting in? Uh, and anthropogenic triggers enhance the soil formation rate from what is primarily a biogenic molecule. And this is um, a, a very important aspect because uh, there's a consensus in the community that uh, biogenics uh, don't form much organic aerosol unless they are uh, or potentially enhanced by uh, pollution uh, that mixes with biogenics. So a, bio a glyoxal molecule that basically forms from isoprene if it's in a pristine environment uh, does it form SOA at the same rate as if that glyoxal molecule forms in a mixed anthropogenic biogenic uh, environment is a question. And I'm going to investigate this by measuring Henry's law partitioning constants in a simulation chamber. 
and uh, asks the question, what factors determine the reactivity of glyoxal in particles? And some uh, papers here, including many of you as co-authors, are, are listed uh, down here. Now, to give you a little introduction into what this glyoxal is, glyoxal is a meaningless molecule. It doesn't really mean anything. And I say that um, uh, from a perspective, it has two carbons and is present in minuscule concentrations. I look at it primarily as an indicator for processes. And so if we understand the story that glyoxal tells us, glyoxal is, an, is a window of opportunity to tell us um, um, a, a chemical story. Uh, and obviously, this picture shows you that we are missing something. And glyoxal tells us that we are missing something. And so that's an unknown unknown. So this is a global measurement of glyoxal from space. Um, you can measure glyoxal from space through absorption spectroscopy. Uh, and it shows this tropical signature. Warm colors means it's enhanced. Uh, and then there is no glyoxal here over these ocean environments. This is a global model prediction. And it shows basically glyoxal is confined to the continents. There is no glyoxal over the ocean, at least as predicted by the model. And that can be understood because, uh, well, the atmospheric lifetime is really short. It photolyzes very quickly. And, um, and so it cannot be transported over long distances in the atmosphere. Well, but the measurement suggests there's a band of glyoxal that spans the entire tropics. And that is really surprising because uh, glyoxal is a very soluble molecule. And so you cannot actually uh, get it out of the ocean. Uh, so why does a soluble molecule emanate from the ocean? Most of it is biogenic. Um, actually, we understand only about half of what the global source is for glyoxal, which is currently estimated only based on the continental source. It ignores the ocean source. And it's 108 teragram of a, uh, of a glyoxal mass uh, produced each year. Half of it is unaccounted. You note that over the Amazon, for example, there's a significant mismatch where the satellite finds more glyoxal than is being predicted. And um, then there is some anthropogenic signature. So it is a potential for this gas that is mostly biogenic. And the question is, how is multiphase chemistry enhanced, for example? This is a different satellite. It's a GOM-2 satellite. <clears throat> and it shows a different picture. Here, glyoxal is present everywhere, uh, essentially, over, uh, with the exception maybe over the Saharan desert. And, uh, and so over the Saharan desert, actually, this satellite shows something. But this satellite shows nothing. But then, really, the striking difference is in the ocean environments, where this satellite says there's about 2 10 to the 14 of a glyoxal present. And this satellite says there's nothing. This has very profound implications for the global source budget of this gas, whether this is right or whether this is right. And one thing we did is build instruments that basically go on ships to probe these gradients. And then with Torero, we were able to, uh, to check up on what is this background concentration in the southern hemisphere oligotrophic ocean, getting away from pollution as best as we can and as far as we can by going to the southern hemisphere and to the remote uh, oligotrophic ocean. Um, so uh, that's uh, one aspect of what we can learn. Now, I want to point out again that this is a lower limit for the global source um, because the question is, is there an ocean source or not? Um, and uh, if there is one, uh, is this right or is, is this right? Glyoxal also associates with particles. Uh, there's field evidence actually uh, from the Arctic, from marine environment um, in Mexico City and in biogenic environment, forested environments. Everywhere glyoxal is found in particles. And this is non-trivial because glyoxal is so volatile. It's such a volatile uh, molecule. To drive home that uh, message, this is a, the structure of glyoxal. And uh, if you look at the vapor pressure of, of glyoxal, it is actually a, a fraction of an atmosphere. Right? It's a small, very volatile molecule. It hydrates. Both of these carbonyls can react with water to form this tetraol. And that increases, actually, the effective solubility by five orders of magnitude. It's a very soluble molecule. And as a result of this uh, hydration, uh, the vapor pressure goes down. But it's still about uh, four orders of magnitude too volatile to actually partition at, uh, at, at uh, uh, has a C star of about 10 to the 4. And Julia and those who work in these units, um, it's, um, it's, it's basically a significant partitioning to aerosols is expected depending on what that aerosol mass concentration is, organic aerosol mass concentration is. It's on the order of 1 to 10, where it kind of gets meaningful. And in a remote atmospheric uh, marine environment, uh, basically, um, glyoxal is in the gas phase, even in this form. 
So if you uh, then think through Clyox all over the ocean, well, that's, that's kind of striking. Let's think what that means. So these lines here are partitioning ratios. A one-to-one -one line means 50% is in the gas phase and 50% is in the condensed phase. And what's plotted here is the effective Henry's law constant of a molecule versus the liquid water content uh, of, for example, a cloud. A cloud has about one gram per uh, cubic meter of liquid water. And if you go to the Henry's law of glyoxal, well, in a cloud, 90% of the glyoxal is partitioned to the water phase, and 10% is in the gas phase. So there, the partitioning is already almost 10 to 1 shifted towards uh, the condensed phase. If you think about the ocean, it is a ton of water per cubic meter. And accordingly, this partitioning ratio is 10 to the 7 to 1 shifted towards the condensed phase. In other words, clyoxal is such a soluble molecule that it's impossible to supersaturate the ocean and outgas clyoxal from the ocean. And then conversely, uh, why would clyoxal associate with particles? Uh, at 4, 10 to the 5, and typical aerosol water concentrations, let's say 10 micrograms water, uh, basically 10 to the 4 to 1 glyoxal is shifted towards the gas phase. There is no reason why glyoxal should be an efficient source for secondary organic aerosols through multiphase chemistry based on what we think we understand about Henry's law partitioning. So it's a, it's a molecule with unique physical and chemical properties, and therefore it's a unique indicator to learn about atmospheric processes. And I want to emphasize these indicator properties of glyoxal as we uh, investigate it. And I also want to point out that the Henry's law constant is not only relevant in the context of this partitioning, but is a very fundamental property uh, in the resistance model for aerosols that it governs basically the rates of multiphase reactions. So the techniques we use to measure glyoxal are based on differential optical absorption spectroscopy, and um, differential uh, and DOAS basically acts on lambert beers law in a modified form. We apply a high-pass filter to our spectra to basically isolate what this, uh, is a structured absorption uh, from what is a broadband extinction process. And so by isolating uh, this uh, structured narrowband absorption after high-pass filtering the, uh, the spectrum, uh, we have a unique fingerprint absorption for glyoxal, which is highly selective and can get very sensitive as well. The instrument we developed for the G5 uh, in my group is, um, I'm going to show it to you in just a second. It's the solar stray light doors. Uh, it is acting with scattered solar photons that are harvested from the atmosphere with a telescope that's mounted below the wing. And uh, we measure these photons at uh, well-defined lines of sight here. And these sets of so-called elevation angles and slant column densities pose an, an inverse problem. They constrain an inverse problem. Uh, to basically measure some uh, vertical distributions here, uh, also from flights at constant flight altitude. If you uh, fly in a limb geometry and you sink this instrument through the atmosphere, you basically become very sensitive by re realizing several hundred kilometers of an absorption pass length in the atmosphere, in the free troposphere. And that allows us to uh, measure uh, things like uh, 50 parts per quadrillion of iodine oxide radicals, uh, that would not uh, survive transfer through sampling lines directly in the open atmosphere without any need to uh, perturb the atmosphere. We also measure a fraction of a parts per trillion for bromine oxide radicals, and for glyoxal, about three parts per trillion is our detection limit in 30 second integration time. This is how uh, the instrument looks like. Uh, it has basically a pylon that's mounted below the wing, and then there's optical fibers here that go through the wing and connect with these rack-mounted spectrometers. In the meantime, we, we are working uh, to remove the operator seat and make this an autonomous instrument uh, to save space on future missions. Um, the uh, wing-mounted telescope actually has a motion compensation system because one thing we really need to know well is our pointing in the atmosphere. And so the purpose of this is to decouple uh, the platform motion from our pointing and we uh, can actually show by comparing with the uh, G5 inertia system that we can do this within 0.2 degree uh, angle accuracy, which is really limited by our encoder resolution on the stepper motor. So we are probably better than that. And that's enough to reduce the error. Um, another technique that we have developed is this cavity enhanced doors. And we spend a lot of time in John and Jeff's uh, facility here to do mechanism uh, development with this instrument and calibrate it with uh, comparing to other to the FTIR system. Um, it basically is a cavity enhanced system with two highly refractive mirrors. We use an LED as a light source 
and uh, supplies a slide uh, which bounces here on the order of uh, uh, several ten to the four times between these mirrors, realizing absorption pass lengths on the order of 20 kilometers. And then we uh, analyze uh, this part of the spectrum here and can, by doing a multispectral analysis, measure all these gases uh, simultaneously. So this was installed on the ship, and we had a fast version of this on the ship to do actually eddy covariance fluxes of glyoxal. So again, this is this uh, conundrum here that atmospheric models do not predict any glyoxal of the oceans. And the first part of the talk will investigate this story. We had a first cruise track uh, during vocals, which actually established that glyoxal is present here off the coast in the marine boundary layer, which is published as uh, Sinnreich et al. 2010. And uh, what I'm going to talk about mostly is a research flight here to this oligotrophic ocean to assess the question, is there glyoxal in the marine boundary layer or, or not? And before I go to the aircraft, I want to uh, show you data here from the marine boundary layer from the ship track that basically was here from Hawaii uh, to, uh, to Costa Rica. So this is uh, what the inlet looked like. This is our instrument mounted on the inside, and, and, and Sean and Ivan where uh, on that cruise, Andrew had been part of a, an undergrad project earlier uh, where we had basically mounted this cavity here on the ship. And uh, they generated this beautiful time series, which is about 30 days of data. Uh, this is spectral proof of glyoxal. It's present at 60 parts per trillion. Um, what's shown here is the absorption spectrum wavelengths over absorbance uh, with the scaled reference spectrum overlaid the noise level of the instrument. And that is spectral proof that glyoxal is, uh, is really present uh, in, in, in the marine boundary layer far away. From, this is about 2,000 uh, kilometers from, uh, from the coast. And now the striking thing is that uh, uh, glyoxal basically has a diurnal cycle that continuously uh, uh, is, is measurable. You never lose it. Uh, the, the amplitude of this uh, diurnal cycle is actually only on the order of uh, 10 parts per trillion. Uh, and we can measure that uh, actually fairly accurately with, with our instrument. Uh, what, what we see is that glyoxal builds up at night, continuously, every night, repetitively, it increases at night. And then during the day, it does not disappear, which is striking because it's such a short-lived gas. It lives only two hours, two and a half hours. So over 12 hours, glyoxal is six times replaced during the day, right? It doesn't decrease. Does, if, if there was no source, no stronger source than this, glyoxal would essentially decay like this. No, it stays elevated. So if we actually um, look at this, we can conclude that the precursor for glyoxal must be an alkene, because a dark reaction forms it. We know the sinks, which are mostly from uh, photolysis and OH radical reactions. Um, actually, photolysis is the primary sink, so we don't depend strongly on oxidative capacity. We then apply the steady state assumption. <coughs> we calculate the rate of glyoxal change here. And uh, we know the uh, loss rate of glyoxal. We effectively have a measurement of the production rate. And that's shown here in black. So it's always positive. There's always some ozone around. This is actually the ozone during this cruise track, very constant at 10 ppt, no diurnal cycle at all. Um, but glyoxal has a very marked photochemical source signature. And that, uh, we conclude, means that the mechanism uh, involves a photochemical alkene source, which then gets converted through ozone reactions. And it's really this imbalance here between your sources and sinks that modulates uh, this diurnal cycle here. We also have the aircraft data, and uh, these are vertical profiles of glyoxal that were measured at these different uh, locations marked on the map. And uh, one thing uh, to highlight is uh, that we do have two gradients. We have uh, basically a gradient here near the uh, top of what is the transition layer into the free troposphere, and we have another gradient in the stratosphere. When we enter uh, um, uh, stratospherically influenced air glyoxal signal goes away. Sometimes we also lose it in the upper free troposphere without getting into the troposphere. But glyoxal is present basically at 10 hertz per trillion throughout the uh, tropical air column. And this is really striking um, because it's only uh, living two hours. Uh, and, and, and up there, the air has not seen the ocean surface for seven days or longer. So it is turned over multiple times. What's the organic carbon source? 
Well, photochemical alkene is what the boundary layer diurnal profiles tell us. Um, and uh, the other thing that we see is that here, for example, over this oligotrophic ocean, research flight three and five, which are the green and the, and, the, and the dark blue line, glyoxal is there. We see glyoxal over the oligotrophic ocean. That means it's probably everywhere. And that means glyoxal is an indicator for a biogeochemical cycle of marine organic carbon, which we are currently missing in global models. If you look at the gradients here between the ocean environment where there is glio where there's very little chlorophyll, and here there's about 20 times more chlorophyll in these uh, uh, mesotrophic ocean environments, uh, so a factor of 20 kind of in, in chlorophyll is uh, really hardly reflected here. The glyoxal changes by a factor of two. So there is some evidence for a biological signature uh, in this glyoxal, but really it's much more broadly distributed than what the chlorophyll A distribution suggests. Now, that's exciting, and, and, and we knew and, uh, that glyoxa was in the free troposphere from a flight we had done in 2010. That was one of the strong motivations that convinced, N or with which I could convince NSF to support the Terrero mission. Uh, we didn't have this nice instrument in 2010, which is a trace organic gas analyzer that's uh, developed here at NCARB in a group from, from Eric Abel with Alan Hills and, and Becky and Dan Reamer at the University of Miami. It's, a, it's basically an online GCMS that with two minute time resolution uh, measures some, how many compounds? <laughs> a variable, 70, 75, cool. So it was 50 during Torero, it was the first deployment and uh, we're very pleased overall with, uh, with, with how it turned out. Uh, now, the, the, the idea here is to basically measure additional species and also measure all the precursors with this instrument and try to explain this, not only the glyoxal source, but also to see are there other OVOCs and can we confirm this online GCMS on the plane that there is, other, that there is oxygenated VOCs other than glyoxal. And so this is now a, a vertical profile here for this research flight five case study, uh, glyoxal again over the oligotrophic ocean, some 15 parts per trillion in the boundary layer, uh, as opposed to more 30, 40 PPT that we see in the cavity enhanced stores at the equator and the biologically more uh, enhanced uh, environments, so a factor of two or so maybe uh, uh, in terms of a biological signature. Now here are all the precursors that are measured by TOGA isoprene, benzene, toluene. It was a really pristine environment and we can explain essentially none of this glyoxal in the free troposphere. Uh, this is now a measurement by TOGA, methyl acyl ketone, another oxygenated VOC, and the only known source for MEK is butane. And so there is no butane. We cannot explain any of this MEK that's observed, but there's some resemblance in the vertical profile here between the optical sensor and the online GCMS. And actually this resemblance in the abundance is also reflected in aerosol surface area here that was measured by UHSAS on the plane, also up here. So the beauty of the Torero approach is that for these compounds that are so short lived, you can apply the, the steady state assumption. Lifetime of glyoxal is only on the order of two hours, which is constrained here actually by observations on, of, of photolysis frequencies of glyoxal measured by, by Sam Hall. MEK is on the order of 10 times as long lived. So you can basically equate uh, or calculate your loss rate by knowing the abundance and your loss rate, and that is equal to your production rate. So you have a measure of the production rate of glyoxal, and we plot that against the collision rate of ozone, for example, with aerosol surface area. Uh, we see that the data organizes here along this line between two completely independent research flights that are flown 10 days apart, 2,000 kilometers apart. The data organizes here in, in, a, in, a, in a way generally consistent slope. Now the slope you could interpret as your reactive uptake coefficient under the assumption if ozone were to react with double bonds on aerosol surfaces, but I don't mean to suggest actually that these OVOCs boil off um, all I, the point I want to make here is that uh, we see this for all these different molecules, um, MEK, this butanol, and the rate of production of these molecule scales uh, basically uh, with the variability in aerosol surface area. Ozone is more or less flat in these case studies. So there's not enough OH collisions, uh, else the slope would be much larger than one and that would be non-physical. 
uh, but the slope here is on the order of a quite efficient reactive uptake coefficient for ozone, uh, in particular for butanol. So to summarize uh, what our four-dimensional measurements tell us, uh, we think a heterogeneous process is involved. And we have a photochemical alkene source from the boundary layer. So we think a heterogeneous photochemical alkene source is a mechanism to explain these OVOCs. And one example for such a mechanism is actually shown here. Uh, so any form of an alkane forms these 1,4-hydroxycarbonyls. Um, that Paul Siemens' work has established this. And when they collide at interfaces, they can basically uh, undergo this cyclization um, to form these cyclic hemiacetals, which in the presence of acid, this equilibrium here towards dehydration is actually shifted to the dehydrated state, the dihydrofuran. So effectively what you're doing is that through a photochemical mechanism, in the presence of heterogeneous uh, surfaces, uh, you're converting an alkane into an alkene, which fits the bill for our a heterogeneous photochemical alkene source. And then a reaction with ozone would be the source for these OVOCs, which actually have been measured, a rate constants at 30 ppb ozone reacts extremely fast. The lifetime is only on the order of seven minutes. So the lifetime of glyoxal is two hours. This is seven minutes. It is uh, on the order of um, 15 to 20 times uh, longer lived as a glyoxal than, the o than this precursor. So if there's 10 ppt of glyoxal, we would expect uh, there to be a fraction of a PPT of this alkene, which would not be possible to measure. Um, another mechanism that actually fits the bell is something we are investigating in a collaboration with uh, Christian George uh, at, at uh, Ursa Lyon. A student of mine is there currently with one of our cavity-enhanced systems to measure glyoxal in a setup like this, uh, where we basically uh, have a photosensitizer on sea, in seawater. And if we put nonanoic acid onto this, um, onto this surface, uh, with humic acid, and we shine light on it, we see non enal coming off. And non enal so non anoic acid gets converted into uh, non enal uh, and when we oxidize this with ozone, we actually see glyoxal formation. Uh, Laura Gonzalez uh, from my group will have a poster on this at, at AGU. Um, it's, um, it's two possible mechanisms that both are heterogeneous photochemical alkene sources. Now, what's the impact of these OVOCs on? on the Hox budget in the free troposphere. If we, uh, we've constrained the 1D box model uh, that we've built in my group here at 5.5 kilometers. Um, if we constrain to observations and photolysis frequencies, the rate of OH formation from ozone photolysis is on the order of 2.6, 10 to the 5 uh, molecules per cc per second. And uh, if we constrain by these carbonyls, uh, combined carbonyls measured by TOGA and uh, and, and, and Amex stores with uh, photolysis frequencies measured uh, by Sam Hall. Uh, the rate of uh, this carbonyl HO2 source is actually almost twice as high as uh, the OH source from, from ozone photolysis. And uh, do want to point out that these OVOCs also are a sink for OH radicals, actually uh, as sufficient sink uh, for OH as, as methane, so they rival methane uh, for OH radicals uh, in the free troposphere. I'm not going to talk about these halogens, which I think play a key role in converting HO2 to OH in the free troposphere, and we actually have measurements of those as well. But the bottom line is that this is clearly relevant in terms of affecting the Hox budget, and we're currently in the process of uh, trying to understand this uh, better. So the conclusion here on hypothesis one is uh, that, yes, we have confirmed glyoxal, MEK, and butanol are present in the free troposphere. There had been previous evidence on acid aldehyde, and, uh, and, and, and it was pulled in question based on the formation of acid aldehyde in sampling lines. It's currently filed as a measurement artifact. Here we have two independent techniques, one that doesn't have any sampling lines, the optical sensor, and, op and, and online mass spectrometry, and both show you the presence of these OVOCs in the tropical free troposphere. We find them over the oligotrophic ocean and not in the stratosphere, and uh, therefore think uh, they are very widely distributed and point to uh, currently unrecognized source for marine organic carbon uh, that most likely uh, involves uh, heterogeneous photochemical alkenes um, as, uh, as a precursor for these OVOCs. And in terms of a, a biological link, is it there? Well, we, maybe. But glyoxal is much more widely distributed than chlorophyll A, and so that suggests actually that uh, 
that, that source estimates that were scaled based on chlorophyll A would underestimate the global source. So is it physics, chemistry, biology? Uh, probably a combination of all of it. And we, we don't know. We, we, we need to look at more Torero case studies uh, to start with. So uh, just briefly, on the second hypothesis, so this was a source perspective. And glyoxal is, a bio, is part of a biogeochemical cycle. It's a molecule we should care about. We have measurements on global scales. We can actually learn something from them. And we are starting to understand that the, that the marine environment uh, actually puts out organic carbon. It's not a net receptor, necessarily, of organic carbon emitted from land. But actually, the marine atmosphere is a source for marine organic carbon. Um, as well. Now, this second part here talks about sinks. I'm going to talk about glyoxal multiphase chemistry and aqueous aerosols. Um, and just want to start out by saying that Henry's law is defined basically as the proportionality a constant between um, the um, concentration of glyoxal in the gas phase and the particulate phase. So, um, uh, for glyoxal, since it hydrates, uh, the uh, the Henry's law constant of the unhydrated form gets converted in what is so-called effective Henry's law, which includes uh, contributions from hydration and, and, and additional reservoirs, like, for example, oligomers in, uh, in particles. So we are going to measure, basically, the effective Henry's law constant by measuring the particulate concentration of glyoxal and the gas phase concentration of glyoxal. And we did this here at a chamber facility in, um, at, at the Paul Scherrer Institute in, uh, in Switzerland. Lots of instruments, including uh, our CE doors. And this technique developed by Thorsten Hoffmann at uh, University of Mainz uh, in Germany, analytical chemist. Um, and so this is actually based on a, a filter uh, sampling extraction and derivatization technique. Gives a very nice detection sensitivity for particulate phase glyoxal. And so then, basically, uh, we, we look at a whole suite of data, uh, primarily looking at ammonium sulfate seed for now and ammonium sulfate mixed seed with fulvic acid. And what we see is that actually, um, uh, so what's plotted here is the logarithm of a ratio of Henry's law constants. And so this is uh, basically uh, uh, the Henry's law constant in dilute cloud water that's used as a reference. And minus 1 means 10 times more. 100 times more, 1,000 times more, in terms of partitioning towards the aqueous phase. We see that uh, with increasing salt concentration, uh, the Henry's law constant increases dramatically by three orders of magnitude. So you have an activity coefficient over the dilute aqueous phase in concentrated salt solutions of 1 over 1,000. And the data organizes here uh, independent of the organic mass contribution uh, within error bars. Uh, and if you dig back in the literature, actually, there is, uh, uh, well, I'm going to get to that in a second. You can quantify what is called a salting constant, um, which is a section of salting constant, a concept well known in the limnology community, to my knowledge, not yet applied to aerosols before. Uh, if we combine this with the comprehensive evidence of literature data, we actually can make sense of uh, all the literature data. But this one point here. Um, in the sense that we think there is a kinetic limitation. Once you basically hit 12 molarity uh, per, uh, of, of ammonium sulfate, you reach the solubility <coughs> limit of ammonium sulfate in aerosols. And at this point, uh, we seem to see evidence that there is a multiphase system. Uh, basically, uh, ammonium sulfate seems to crystallize or start crystallizing. And that leads to a, a, a kinetic limitation in how uh, glyoxal is being pulled into uh, uh, these aerosols. Um, more about salting effects. It's actually in the German literature first described in 1889. Um, and uh, I want to point you to this reference if you uh, want to know more. Um, now, this kinetic limitation, if we basically segregate our time-resolved Henry's law constant measurements uh, into two pools of data, one basically above and one below this uh, solubility limit of ammonium sulfate, we actually see uh, that uh, there's a different time dependence. We, we can't really resolve uh, with these filter samples how quickly glyoxal is pulled in. 
Uh, it's on the order of less than 100 uh, seconds that this uh, first equilibrium here is established. And then we see some increase here uh, towards uh, longer time scales, which we interpret as oligomer formation. If you go to uh, about the concentration of ammonium sulfate above the solubility limit of ammonium sulfate, this rate slows down dramatically by two orders of magnitude. So that's direct evidence uh, that we think uh, this, this is truly a kinetic effect and not a, a, a thermodynamic effect, necessarily. So uh, what this kind of means, we have applied then these Henry's Law parameterizations to the Mexico City case study, which we had uh, worked on um, in 2003 and published papers in 2006 and 7 that set loose a, a whole debate about secondary organic aerosol formation in the context of anthropogenic pollution, um, is that the Henry's Law is not 10 to the 5, like in the dilute aqueous phase, but it is rather here, 10 to the 8, 10 to the 9. And that actually can explain then significant uh, SOA formation from glyoxal and more importantly, it actually is governing the, uh, in this resistance model also the reactivity of glyoxal. There's ample building blocks available to basically form these different uh, product pathways. And now um, I want to point out that we have put the salting mechanism here in a collaboration with Alma Hotchik and Christoph Noth in the Wolfcam. And finally, Christoph's paper has made it into uh, ACPD. Uh, it basically points to relevance of this in the northeastern US. And, um, and, uh, and, and we are working on, or continue to work on this uh, in the lab now. Um, I want to point out that actually what Christoph benefited from here is a lot of experiments that my student Ryan did with John and Jeff in terms of refining the isoprene oxidation mechanism and uh, many measurements from the Kalnex campaign, both on aircraft as well as on the ground, um, as well as these laboratory experiments uh, that I just uh, showed to you. Now, we've gone back uh, this uh, summer and um, investigated this role of anthropogenic triggers. Clearly, sulfate is an anthropogenic trigger, and sulfate triggers this increase in Henry's law. What we looked at this summer is the role of ammonia. And here's just one snapshot. So we use acetylene as our glyoxal source. It's a very volatile uh, precursor. And then when we basically form the glyoxal here, uh, in the presence and absence of ammonia, we see in the absence of ammonia hardly any aerosol growth. But in the presence of ammonia, we see uh, basically 10 times more overall aer aerosol growth. And uh, we see actually up to 60 times more imidazole formation. So this ammonium activity, um, it's not only the anion which basically creates the salting effect, it's also the cation that strongly affects in the activity of that cation, accelerates uh, the, the rate of imidazole formation and overall SOA formation. And this is uh, a real exciting second dimension in terms of uh, the strong effect of pH in aerosols as well as a cation reactivity actually um, in, an, in a radical depleted environment like uh, condensed uh, aerosol water. So in terms of uh, the conclusions here, this is really hypothesis two. Yes, we have confirmed uh, that there is anthropogenic triggers, um, uh, both in form of sulfate and ammonia. The sulfate pulls in through ionic effects, basically these building blocks, and leads to activity coefficients of one over a thousand. Um, and ammonia can actually accelerate these reactions uh, by, by orders of magnitude. And in Mexico City, we do have a lot of ammonia. We have 40 parts per billion ammonia. It's much more neutralized particles than actually uh, in Los Angeles and other parts. So um, uh, we had shown in this paper here in collaboration with uh, um, Julia and, uh, and Sasha, uh, that um, glyoxal can affect mas macroscopic properties uh, of aerosols like the oxygen to carbon ratio um, that is uh, due to both of these reactions in Mexico City, as we think. Um, what we currently don't understand is the role of other cations and anions and other salts, uh, including possibly aluminum uh, uh, ions, organic salts. Uh, now, what I do point out is that both ammonia and sulfate are two kind of components in uh, aerosol nucleation. And so uh, aerosol nucleation has, of course, even less water, but it doesn't need much water for glyoxal to hydrate. Just interfacial water is actually enough. And you have in these clusters uh, that Jim measures, you, you have the right components in order to basically trigger this um, multiphase chemistry of one of these very, so very volatile molecules like glyoxal. So is there actually a, a, a role um, uh, of 
activity coefficients and salting uh, effects in uh, the growth of nanoparticles is something that we hope to investigate uh, uh, in the future. Uh, so uh, to conclude, um, new instruments are key, and uh, this is not limited to our uh, developments in instruments. It's really the combination of optical spectroscopy and, and mass spectrometry that I think drive home the point uh, during Torero. So these developments at NCAR are key and I think are um, increasingly appreciated uh, in the context also of um, uh, the, the, the um, EOL deployments. Um, the, these anthropogenic triggers are, are really interesting and biogenic, makes, uh, biogenic glioxar makes a sample system to investigate uh, this, bio, this anthropogenically controlled biogenic SOA. Um, and uh, this is relevant in the marine context uh, as well as uh, in the terrestrial um, biogenic uh, context. And with that, I uh, want to uh, thank uh, the, uh, the funding and uh, acknowledge um, uh, NCAR EUL and REF um, for uh, supporting the Torero mission, uh, the entire Torero team. Um, and this is just a picture here from a workshop we held at CU Boulder. Um, and the um, uh, red are graduate students in my group and um, and um, and so actually, if you haven't seen Sean, he was on the ship. Ivan was on the ship, um, and uh, we have great support also from David Thompson in terms of software development for uh, to build these instruments. Um, and with that, uh, I I just want to point out that we look forward to contrast in January February 2014. It's going to be a great homolog experiment here over the Western. Um, uh, Pacific uh, that is complementary to the um, things we have done from ships. These are all the cruises we have done and uh, and all the aircraft flights from Torero. And we also would be looking forward uh, to Frappe, which uh, anybody here works on Frappe? Oh yes, hi. <laughs> um, so the um, uh, ground-based deployment of the NOAA mobile lab with these mobile column observations that we hope to investigate the, the oil and natural gas exploration here in the Colorado Front Range. And with that, uh, I'd be happy to take questions. Okay, we do have time for questions. Microphone, no? Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I, I know you said you're looking at other ions for this salting in effect, but I wonder if you can uh, give us your thoughts about perhaps the role for uh, sodium chloride um, for the you know as as a provider of ionic compounds in in marine aerosol, and what role they may play in the glyoxal partitioning. So sodium chloride um, is one of the seeds we investigated this summer. Um, did several experiments and saw some of the most interesting chemistry um, that uh, is not yet characterized. Um, it is very reactive. Um, we actually um, need to be a little careful because um, it's one of the most difficult systems to study. You cannot measure sodium chloride with the AMS easily, so we, we rely a lot about on, on aerosol size distributions and can't make quantitative sense of the data. In terms of the product studies, we observe these imidazoles in all the seeds. And that means that the salting behavior um, basically is going on. Um, we think it's not limited to sulfate in terms of uh, these enhancements in, uh, in, in the salting uh, behavior. Now, what is the exact salting constant? Um, I can't tell you. Uh, but that is the objective of, uh, of the experiments we have done. We also looked at potassium sulfate to remove the, ammon uh, the, the, the cation role in the ammonium sulfate. We looked at, um, at uh, sodium nitrate to look at the, um, at the nitrate salting uh, constant. And uh, we did all of this in the presence and absence of, uh, of ammonia, uh, basically to, uh, to contrast reactivity from salting behavior. But we think this uh, mechanism of salting is a is a is a um, <clears throat> more general pathway. It's not limited to sulfate, and um, it's not limited to glyoxide probably either. Um, 
the reason we can see it in glyoxal is because the effective Henry's law constant of glyoxal is already 4, 10 to the 5. And in terms of this enhancement of, uh, of the Henry's law constant, uh, you always depend on this number in terms of what overall mass you form. So for methyl glyoxal, which is two orders of magnitude less soluble, or formaldehyde for that matter, uh, you would form two orders of magnitude less of a SOA mass if you had the same, uh, if you had the same uh, uh, salting constant, not SOA mass, but effective Henry's law enhancement, activity coefficient, so to speak. Um, and, and, and so this is already a challenging measurement to do in the particle phase. You have a filter here, you're talking about uh, nanograms of material that you're collecting on the filters. I mean, tens to hundreds of, of nanograms, but if you get into this regime, it, it turns into tens of nanograms. So uh, for a methyl glyoxal, it would be 0.1 nanogram uh, under the same conditions. Now, you can't easily compensate for that by raising your gas phase concentration because you may be subject to oligomerization reactions, which become much more uh, relevant under high concentrations. And so in that sense, I think glyoxal is again a window into a more broader um, mechanism, but uh, uh, it's difficult analytically to do an atmospherically meaningful characterization of the salting behavior, probably for less soluble um, OVOCs. In the beginning of your talk, you showed uh, glyoxal measured in space and uh, the model didn't represent the uh, emissions of the ocean, so you didn't, you didn't have any glyoxal. Are there any places where the aircraft observations measure glyoxal, but the satellite doesn't, or vice versa? It depends which satellite. So the, uh, this satellite would not measure any glyoxal here, but we show it's there. Mm -hmm. uh, that same spot in this satellite shows there is glyoxal. So we actually are more consistent with this satellite and therefore think it is a very widespread gas that is part of a, a biogeochemical cycle that involves marine organic carbon. Uh, the one place where we haven't seen glyoxal is here. We had actually a ship cruise over the Atlantic Ocean where, we, uh, where, where, where you see this minimum that, where we were probably below our detection limit. I'd like to go over the Sahara with the aircraft. Maybe we do that in a couple of years. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> um, and in the stratosphere. We haven't seen it in the stratosphere. And that's, um, that's where we are really pleased to see it disappear because uh, high ozone in sampling lines is one hypothesis of how these OVOCs can form in sampling lines. So we don't have a sampling line, so it should disappear. But it's good to know your instrument reads a zero somewhere. All right, one more question. So how would we represent this in a model uh, is, I guess, the question that follows. And we'd be happy to talk to you about that separately. It was just a, a quick point of clarification about the mechanism you proposed for the formation of glyoxal. So you start with the hydroxycarbonyl, which forms a hemiacetal, and then a, um, a furan, dihydrofuran. So you have the, the loss rates for the hydrofurans with ozone as being um, very quick, but you haven't said anything about glyoxal yields from the ozonolysis of these things. They're not known. Is that the... We're building uh, a chamber facility at, uh, at, at CU Boulder, and uh, uh, with Paul Zeman uh, now being a faculty at uh, CU, uh, he has actually done these rate constant measurements and looked at these product studies. So one of the things we want to do is uh, effectively do the experiments that would answer your question. But uh, it's, um, there has been no glyoxal measurement. There is so some evidence that these ozone reactions lead to acid formation. In, um, and so that's a uh, source then for this type of mechanism, because we can't say that this should, this would depend basically on the substitution here of this R group in terms of whether it actually lends itself to what's glyoxal as a particular molecule that could form here as a product. Um, in this experiment, we have actually shown that there is uh, glyoxal formation from non-anoic acid. And so uh, that these, these alkanoic acids as precursors are, um, do they quantitatively explain this? I don't know, but uh, organic acids are prevalent in the marine environment. All right, let's thank Reiner one more time.